I invite you to remain standing as we conclude our series of sermons today, Lost and Found, as we look at the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the prodigal son. Today we look at the response of the father. So I invite you to hear these uh, holy words, beginning with the 11th verse of the 15th chapter. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, and there was, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. again say a word of welcome this morning to all of you. We're glad you're here today. Before I start my sermon, I want to say something just briefly about the events that have taken place in Charlottesville, Virginia. When I was a little boy, I lived in Charlottesville. It sounds like that's not going to be the last of those kind of issues that we have to face as a nation. We are a very divided nation. It is not a political persuasion issue. It is an issue of bigotry and racism, of hate that's what this is fundamentally all about. When we ever believe that somehow we're superior to someone else because of their race, sexual orientation, nationality, whatever it may be, we are in for a mess. We are going to create pain and suffering and agony, and that's what's happening. When anyone espouses to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and says that they are driven by their faith to harm someone else. They have spoiled, tainted, ruined the gospel message. There are those who are saying in a variety of ways that as Christians, they are going to take back America. Now, you know what that means. It's for folk like me. Here's the problem. If we're going to take back America and give it to the people who had it originally, then most every one of us have no right to it. Only the Native Americans do. The rest of us came from somewhere else. And one of the issues that I have with all of this is that there are people who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ in the midst of all this hatred, all the pain that they're creating, all the suffering that has taken place, 
and they have the audacity to say they believe in Jesus. That is not the case. These are people who are fueled by hatred. They are fueled by racism and bigotry. And it has no place in the United States of America. And it certainly has no place for those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. It sounds like to me this is not the last of those kinds of issues that we're going to have to face, that there are planned rallies in other parts of the country. Now, we as followers of Jesus Christ say that we love our neighbor. In fact, Jesus was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Anybody who tries to twist that into anything else or distort that in any way is not a true follower of Jesus Christ. You cannot follow the Prince of Peace and try to harm others who are different. When any of us believe that we have a right to acknowledge we're better than anyone else because of our skin color or anything else, we have reached a place of darkness where no one belongs. That means that we as the church and we as followers of Jesus Christ have to go out of our way to make sure that the world understands that we love God and we love neighbor and everyone, regardless of their race or their ethnicity or what they look like or where they live or anything else, stands in the way of what we believe to be true. We follow Jesus who embraced all, and nothing short of that is worth it. We call it what it is. It is racism, it is hate, it is bigotry, and we have to stand up against it. No one else will if the church of Jesus Christ does not. We're glad you're here. Let's pray. Thank you. We follow Jesus, period. Let's pray. Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. When I was in college, I didn't come home very often on the weekends, but when I did, I made a grand spectacle out of it. I flung open the door dropped down my bags of dirty laundry, said that I was starving to death, I needed something to eat. My mother would immediately embrace me, take my laundry, start it right away, throwing everything in the washer, probably gagging while she was doing it. <laughs> then she would say, John, come into the kitchen, I've got something for you to eat. I knew you were coming home, look at all this food, and I would just say, oh, Mom, I'm so thankful, thank you very much. My dad, on the other hand, responded a little bit differently when I came home. Usually it was something like this. Hey, Dad, listen, can I borrow some money? John, how many times do I have to tell you? This is not your house anymore. You don't live here. Go back to school where you belong. <laughs> By the end of the weekend, I had all I could eat. My laundry was folded nicely. It was time to go back. My mom would give me a hug, and my dad would pull me aside and say, you know I love you. Here's a little money. Please be safe heading back to school. I knew I could always go home. No matter what was going on in life, I could always go home. And when I got home, I knew love would be waiting for me in a variety of ways. Jesus tells an interesting parable about a father who has two sons. The father in the parable represents God. The sons represent people like you and me. The second-born son goes to his father, and he says, Dad, I want my share of the inheritance. Now, here's what was unusual and inappropriate about that. 
One did not receive an inheritance until the father was dead. So in essence, what the younger of the two sons says to his father is this, something incredibly disrespectful. As far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me. But ironically, the father gives him his portion of the inheritance, and he goes off, as Scripture says, in wild living. He's having a good time, as long as money will buy a good time. But eventually, as we know, he runs out of money. And when he runs out of money, he runs out of friends, he runs out of food, he runs out of everything, and he's desperate. And he finds himself as a good Jewish boy in the place no Jew would ever want to be, among the pigs, feeding the swine, having to eat what it is the swine eat. And Scripture tells us he comes to his senses, no kidding. And he decides that he's going to try and go home. But it's going to be different, he knows, when he goes home. He cannot possibly expect anything other than a level of condemnation for what he's done. He said to his father, in essence, you're dead to me. But you know, his hired hands, his father's hired hands, get three square meals a day. Maybe I can just do that. So as we can imagine, he rehearses along the way as he's going home, God, uh, I've, uh, Father, I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against God. I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. If I could just be a servant. He rehearses it, we know, over and over again. And as he closes in on the home, he sees someone running toward him. It's his father. And he, having rehearsed along the way, groveling before his very dad, says this, Listen, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am not worthy to be called your son, and the father will have none of it. He doesn't have time for it. He simply says in the moment, someone bring me a ring, someone bring me a robe, someone kill the fatted calf, this son of mine that was lost has been found, we are going to have a party. The son, of course, would have expected condemnation, but instead he receives compassion. How can this be? He said the most vile of things to his father. How can this be? He lived a life of debauchery. How can this be? He abandoned everybody. But they're going to have a party for him because the one who was lost has been found. It's an extraordinary example of God's exceptional grace for us. The father who represents God runs to the son. The father couldn't care less about his motives while he, why he's there. His motives are he's driven by hunger. Who cares? He's home. He did things that are unspeakable. Who cares? He's home. Somewhere in the back of the son's mind, he knew that even though things didn't turn out as he ever thought they would, they were much better than that, that he could always go home. It's interesting that every one of us can fit into the category of the younger son at one time or another. We've wandered away. We've tried other things. We believe that we can do it on our own. We believe that we can buy fun and happiness and all of those kind of things only to come up empty. And we too sometimes have come to our senses and realized that we are in the midst of extraordinary sin and darkness and we want out of that. And there's something that rings in our head that says to us, well, I can always go home. And for us, as followers of Jesus Christ, home is the church. Robert Frost said, home is a place that when you go there, they have to take you in. That's what we believe about the church. That when we come here, we have to take you in because we're not the one extending the invitation. God extends the invitation. God is the one who runs to us no matter where we've been or what we've done. When we come in here, we are home. There really ought to be a sign out front of the church that says, welcome home. There are a lot of people in the world, like the younger son, we fit into that category before, who have found themselves trying everything, looking for happiness over here, lifting this up to see if it's under there, only to discover that their life of sin and shame remains with them. It is our responsibility to remind them that they do have a home and that there is a father ready to run and embrace them and claim them all over again. And they don't have to be shackled and chained to all of that which seeks to destroy. 
You know, it's fascinating if we look at this encounter between the father and his two sons. The older son is put out that the younger son is extended grace. And though the older son never really left home, he was the one who was lost in many ways, but the father comes to him as well. The two sons who are lost in their own way still in both instances have the father come to them and invite them to be a part of the celebration. So when we think about what it means to be a part of the life of the church, we remind ourselves, first of all, that every one of us are a people of sin. Every one of us have fallen short. And the irony is there are a lot of people in the world who believe, I don't want to be a part of the life of the church because those people think they're spiritually superior to everybody else. The truth of the matter is we gather together here because we know we have made mistakes, and we know we are sinful, and that means we know we cannot save ourselves. We need a Savior. We need each other. We need to know that we're not alone, that our sin is not going to remain with us forever. If we come into a place like this, among a people like this, who are just as sinful as we can be, and know that there is a God of grace and forgiveness who runs to us and embraces us and claims us as his own. Do you know in this very church, we have people who are addicted to alcohol, people who are addicted to drugs, people who are addicted to pornography. You're welcome here. It doesn't mean we condone any of those. It just means that we believe in a God of mercy who can free you from that which seeks to destroy you and who will give you, by the power of the Holy Spirit in this community, a sense of support and encouragement that you can move beyond your sin and your pain. We have people in this church who have been unfaithful to their marriage vows. You're welcome here. We're not condoning adultery, but we are saying that we believe in a God of forgiveness, a God that will enable you through God's great power and love to allow you to move beyond your major mistake and the pain you have caused other people. We have people in this congregation who say stupid stuff and do stupid things, who are self-centered, egotistical. You're welcome here. I'm with you. It doesn't mean we condone any of that. It just means that every one of us are a people who have somehow become flawed, broken, mistake-prone. We don't categorize and we don't compartmentalize. We don't form a committee and evaluate your deepest, darkest secrets and then make a determination about whether or not you're worthy if you meet certain criteria, but those over here, no way. Every one of us are flawed, and every one of us are in need of a Savior. That means every one of us who are invited by that Savior are welcome here to become better than who we are today, tomorrow, and even better the next day, driven by love and a desire to recognize that Christ can offer us everything we need, and we can't find it somewhere else or in something else. That's important for us to keep in mind as we think about what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. We are flawed, we are mistake prone, and yet we need someone who will love us and we need a place where we can fit in. And we all at one time or another long to be in that situation. I think what's fascinating to me is that if we ever made a decision to determine who's worthy and who's not, I'm not sure I can be your pastor. I mean, if we're going to make certain rules, the criteria for who's welcome in the life of the church, certain uh, behaviors, and we're going to make certain ways of thinking and doing, I don't always think the right thing. I don't always do the right thing. And some things I should be doing, I don't do. But you're just like me. I'm welcome here and you're welcome here because I don't extend the invitation. The choir doesn't extend the invitation. The other pastors don't extend the invitation. It comes from God, the one who runs to us and embraces us. And here's what's fascinating about this parable. The father runs to the son in Jewish culture in that day and time. 
Men didn't run. It was uncouth, inappropriate, out of place. But notice Jesus makes a big deal about the father running to the son. See, God doesn't care about what the cultural mores are. He doesn't care about what other people think. All God cares about is that one who was lost has been found. And that one believed that somehow deep down inside he could still come home. Now, he thought he could come home and be like a servant, but God had something much better and much greater in store for him. See, when we wander off from God, we wander away and do whatever we want, God runs to us. When we somehow do those things we shouldn't do, God runs to us. When we believe that we are our own God, God runs to us. In one of my churches, I've mentioned several times, we had an AIDS care team early in my ministry. We cared for people dying of AIDS. You can imagine we were compartmentalized, we were labeled, we were categorized as a church. I certainly was as a pastor. But they came to our church, and many of those people had been wounded by the church. They were told just to their face, you don't belong, you can't be here. Someone like you has no place. But word got out that they were welcome in our church, and they came and they came. And there was one young man that I was talking to who was a part of the church who had been abused by the church in a variety of ways. And he came back. And I said, why would you be here? And he said to me, John, it feels like home. See, you can always come home because a real church of Jesus Christ recognizes its frailties and its faults and that every one of us are in need of a Savior, and every one of us long to be in the presence of the one who can do something about our sin. So we have to ask ourselves continually as a church, who are we? What are we all about? Are we going to be one of those judgmental congregations who determines who's welcome and who's not? Are we going to be condemning of people who are not like us? Or are we going to be a church that flings open the doors and says, look, you're as messed up as I am. Welcome. You're, we're glad you're here but we have someone we follow who's never messed up and can clean up your mess. I love the story of the prophet Hosea. If you read the book of Hosea, right off the bat, God tells Hosea to marry a woman by the name of Gomer. I mean, that would be difficult enough, wouldn't you think, to be married to a woman named Gomer? But nevertheless, God tells him, you marry this woman named Gomer, and oh, by the way, she's a woman of ill repute. We know what that means. He has three children with her. He loves her desperately, but she's never faithful to him, and she always wanders off. Hosea comes into the presence of God and says, look, I need to tell you, I love this woman. She's important to me. She matters to me. She's the mother of my three children. She's my wife. I love her. But she keeps hurting me, and she keeps leaving me, and she keeps causing me all kinds of pain. And God says to Hosea in his own way, well, now you know how I feel. And God says, go find her. So Hosea goes after his wife, and he finds her. She's on the auction block. She's going to be sold. She's tattered and she's torn and she's worn out and used up. And Hosea buys her back with an exorbitant amount of money. He takes the one who betrayed him and hurt him and abandoned him, and he brings her home. Because of the power of Jesus Christ taking upon himself on the cross the sin of all of humanity for all of time, we can go home. The division between us and God was our sin, but Jesus has taken upon himself that sin so that we can go home. He runs after us. Sometimes we're tattered and we're torn and we're worn out and he runs after us and he embraces us and we say, listen, God, I got to tell you, listen, I want to tell you, listen, I know I'm not worthy. And God says, mm, I don't have time for that. We're going to have a party. I don't care what your motives are. You're home. That's all that matters. See, all of us desperately, really deep down inside want to be able to go home. Ernest Hemingway tells a story about a father and son who had a quarrel. The son ran away from home. The father, heartbroken, 
tries to find his son named Paco. He travels to Madrid, Spain, and asks people, have you seen my son? Have you seen my son? To no avail. So he puts out an ad in the local paper, and it says something like this. Dear Paco, this is your father. I love you very much. Please come home. I will meet you tomorrow at this location at noon. The next day when the father arrived at that location at noon, there were 800 Pacos there. They're all looking for a father who invites them home. The father in this story is God. And the greatest news we can ever hear is that we are loved, period, by God. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, no matter what we've left undone, no matter how dark our world may have been or is right now, We believe that the light of the world himself can come into our midst, who invites us into his presence, who says welcome home, and can make us whole again. That can happen right here, among this group of people. So, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter where I've been, no matter what I've done, When we walk in here, the good news is that God says to us, welcome home. So don't ever say that shameful statement that some people make when someone comes back who has been lost. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Here she is. The walls are going to cave in. The roof is going to collapse. I promise you, the structural integrity of this sanctuary is not dependent on your spiritual journey or mine for that matter. The last thing someone wants to hear when somehow they've mustered up the courage to come back, having wandered away, is that they're not welcome or that they stand out like a sore thumb. Every one of us, every one of us need to know that when we have wandered off, and all of us have, There is a God of grace, a God of mercy, and there is a God of forgiveness that we know in a man named Jesus, who is the Christ, who has invited you back, and you're here. So on behalf of God, I say to all of you, welcome home. Hallelujah. Amen.